Hello and welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm your host, Patty Nuovo, and I'm very pleased to have today our guest. Her name is Denise Cagini. She is a master massage therapist, and she's here with us today to be able to talk about massage therapy. Denise, welcome. Thank you. Denise, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I know especially here in California and in Petaluma, people are much more familiar with massage therapy, but tell, tell us a little bit about it and how did you get involved with it? Well, that's a great question to start off with. You know, uh, originally I, this is my second profession. I was in business the first 20 years of my, of my first career. and. Um, and then I decided to make a switch, and I was very, always very interested in holistic medicine and alternative medicine and uh, Eastern philosophy when I was younger. And so I decided to take a year off after my first career and went to New England and explored some things there, and eventually uh, relocated to uh, Missouri, where I was on a, at a wellness center for 15 years. And it was there that the idea came to me about becoming a massage therapist. If someone would have told me years ago that, that I would be a massage therapist, I would say, no, I don't believe that. But I think when you make uh, certain decisions in your life that lead you along a path that really resonates with your heart and your mind and your spirit, um, then I think that other opportunities just seem to drop in your lap, things that you would have never thought of or dreamed of before in your life. So that's how I began in massage, and it was, uh, would you like to learn massage? And I said, sure, I'll try it, never knowing that I would really have a passion or a talent or a desire to even do it as much. Now, Denise, you not only have your own <coughs> private practice here in Petaluma, you also work part-time at a high-end spa. That's true, yes. You also teach students how to become massage therapists. So I'm curious, why is your title Master Massage Therapist? What does that mean? Well, a Master Massage Therapist is a title that I uh, acquired when I was living in Missouri and working in Arkansas. And I was state licensed in both states. Both, both Arkansas and Missouri are licensed state regulated. Uh, California has not been uh, state licensed and I think over the last few years they have been trying to become state licensed, which means you have a regulatory board and certain requirements that are set down on a state level that you have to adhere to. And for me, when I was working in Arkansas at a day spa, actually at the time, I wanted to further my education in massage therapy. I was already a certified massage therapist in the state of Missouri, but I wanted to continue my education and so when I was working in Arkansas, I decided to continue and become, in the state of Arkansas, a master massage therapist, which meant more training and um, certain requirements that I had to pass to be able to uh, acquire that new license mm -hmm. and title. So I am still state licensed in both states, even though I've recently relocated to uh, Northern California three years ago. Now, I've heard a lot of different terms used in massage therapy. Uh, terms like deep tissue, Swedish, uh, aromatherapy, reflexology. Can you just talk about some of it? What is that all about? Well, I think that the field of massage is a very, can be a very broad field, uh, an exciting field, and there's many avenues that a therapist can pursue. In my stage of the, uh, in the stages that I have progressed in massage therapy, there are certain things that I started out doing and there are other things that I uh, had more of an interest later on in pursuing. And I think that's the beauty of being in this profession where you're not necessarily locked into a certain modality. There's many modalities you can study and uh, acquire certification in and open up a private practice. So I think that when you hear terms like deep tissue um, and Swedish, Swedish to me is the foundation massage, where you, the beginning of understanding body work, where you learn the Swedish techniques um, and, and develop the foundation and understanding of massage therapy, along with other classes that you would take, like anatomy and physiology and therapeutic modalities, other courses as well. But the hands-on training that I began with was, is Swedish, and usually I think that's most established in many schools across the country where Swedish is considered the basic training that you would need. And then later you can acquire other education in different what they call modalities or body, body work 
body work. And so um, deep tissue is uh, more techniques that you would learn um, to produce a certain effect and get into uh, the deeper levels of tissue in the body. And then when you hear terms like reflexology, well, that's a whole different um, uh, profession in and of itself. You, be, you can become certified in reflexology. And, and is not that even, with this picture that you brought here, an Egyptian picture, they're working on their feet? Well, they're working here. This is a, a replica of an ancient Egyptian uh, papyrus found in one of the early caves in ancient Egypt. And here you can see that there are servants working on uh, other people here, two figures here, and one servant is working on the foot and one servant is working on the hand. And, um, and so it dates way, way back where they're manipulating or massaging the feet or actually making, they could be even using some pressure point work. So it just, it just tells you that massage therapy, uh, the art of massage has been around for many years and many different cultures in, in this world. You know, the earliest recordings were back in, in on the caves, 15,000 B.C. But I think in my, you know, when I sit down and think about it, I think the beginning of man, the beginning of woman, um, I think in the early days of the, uh, the history of the human race, everyone in, in some way, shape, or form has rubbed themselves. You know, if they've got an injury or banged into something, immediately your instinct is to rub it to help the circulation, to help calm the tissue down. So I think that inherently we all do massage in some way, shape, or form. Is there, why did you choose the modalities that you picked for your profession? Are there any that you like over others? Sports, pregnancy, things like that? Well, I have been practicing massage for 13 years now. And um, I still really, truly love the Swedish. I think the Swedish offers a lot uh, for a variety of age groups and helps to deal with a variety of conditions. People do sometimes have health issues. And I think that it is like the mothership for me. It is just a fantastic, uh, have, it, it has fantastic strokes that I personally love. And as I acquired other interests, I do have a, an appreciation for deep tissue because deep tissue helps to also get into uh, chronic areas in the body that have bothered people for quite some time and give relief to that. And reflexology initially didn't resonate with me when I first started out when I was younger, but now I just absolutely love it. I think the timeliness of where you are in your life and what you've moved through in body work and the experiences that you had, and have had, and the, particularly the clients that you have worked on over the years, I think also is a big part in you becoming and wanting to become more of a healer. Heal, a healer, by my definition, is someone who gives energy through touch to someone else to help that person heal themselves. I see. Now you also, there's another term that you use, you teach holistic massage therapy. So how is that different from just regular massage therapy? Could you explain that? Yes, I could. Uh, holistic massage therapy is a wonderful way to learn massage because holistically we we at the Institute in Petaluma, Sky Hill Institute, where I teach currently, the philosophy is that we, we help the individual to acquire mind, body, spirit, and emotional harmony. And the more that you step, when you step into a holistic massage therapy program, there are, there are hours in that program that are dedicated to you, the massage therapist, the becoming, you becoming a massage therapist. And so you have opportunities to look within yourself to see where some of your let's say your emotional blocks or physical blockages or you know mental limitations whatever you feel issues are holding you back it gives you an opportunity to dive into that and to come to under some some clarity and understand this of awareness and that in and of itself is a very healing process and i think that when you when you look to work on healing yourself and removing those blockages, your energy has an opportunity to flow uh, your qi in Chinese, the qi representing energy. It has an opportunity to flow more within your body and help you to become more intuitive 
and become uh, more pure. Uh, purity by meaning your energy is not as limited as it might be with some emotional things in the way or mental things in the way. So it helps you to become a better person and heal yourself as, and then therefore you can your work becomes much more of a higher degree of energy, I feel, in helping someone heal themselves. So is that a description of what you shared with me prior to the show about healing the healer within? Yes, I think that's a brief description of it. I think in a nutshell you could say so, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, your energy, your touch, your sensitivity and awareness and intuitiveness is, uh, is all necessary to understanding the person that you have the privilege of working on. I, I believe that it is an honor and a privilege to be able to touch someone and help someone feel better. Whether that is just simply relaxation or whether that is to help someone to cope with something that is physically challenging. You know, it's interesting in our society we seem to be moving away from touch. Uh, many times there's not enough time in the hospital for nurses who traditionally have been touch professionals to be able to do that. And then, of course, you have all litigation. Teachers can't touch, and in business you're not supposed to touch. So it's almost something that has been so natural and so healing has we've gone away from it. So uh, where do you see a specific need for touch? Is it just with people who are ill? Is, is the clientele that comes to see you, is it because they're hurting or because they are trying to get in touch with themselves? Are they sick? I mean, who typically gets massage? Is there a typical person who gets massage? I don't think there is a typical person that gets massage. I think everyone that walks in is, is um, unique in what they are bringing into the massage, se the massage session. It is the wonderful thing about massage, it, 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 it encompasses all age levels, male or female, um, and it's, it's wonderful to be working in that profession because everyone needs touch. Touch in and of itself, whether that's a handshake or uh, someone has their arm around someone else. A hug. A hug, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. In, in that environment where it is totally a giving environment, totally unconditional, and where you're uh, sending someone energy, it, it absolutely can be very comforting on, to all ages and, and gender uh, throughout any culture. Touch is essential to health, I feel. Hugs are essential to have during the day. Um, within your family, within your friends, within your peers, and, and uh, can be very loving and coming from um, a place where it's just unconditional, wanting nothing back whatsoever. And the world would do, I feel, uh, turn around in the health arena if everyone really gave hugs and, and uh, was more conscious, uh, conscious of uh, the uh, potential that touch has in all fields, really. Mm -hmm. The specifically with touch, I talk to other <coughs> professionals, and there are sometimes that it's a term called contraindications. Are there types of things that? Um, massage therapists, it might not be in the best interest of someone if they have an illness or if they have uh, a broken bone or what have you. What would the type of contraindications be? And I know the list is probably long, but can you give me an example of one or two specifically for massage therapy? Well, uh, very simply, if someone has a condition called osteoporosis, where uh, the bones are becoming brittle, in knowing that, you would not necessarily be wanting to do uh, deep tissue work on an elder, and an elder by someone uh, who, you can have osteoporosis at a younger age, but let's say you have someone who's in their 70s or even in their 80s and they have this condition, just because of their age and the, and the condition of the muscle tone and, and the bones, you would want to not do something that was more on a very deep level because you wouldn't want to create some type of inflammation or even cause any kind of minor fracture if the bones were very brittle. So yes, that's one simple example of 
why you would not use a deeper, deep tissue massage on someone with a certain condition such as that, um, unless obviously you had a doctor's approval to do so. So uh, there's other chronic situations and that you would have where you would have to take, uh, possibly you would need a doctor's approval, someone who is, who has cancer, uh, and someone who's go- undergoing treatment, uh, you would have to have uh, a doctor's approval to work on them, or you may have to, they may have to wait until after their treatments are over for a certain amount of time, uh, and then get a doctor's note to clear so that somebody can, can do massage, because the massage in and of itself can affect the lymphatic flow, the circulatory system, the blood flow, obviously, and so that can... Um, affect the condition in a, in a negative way. And um, we're getting back to the, the area of touch, which we, we just talked about for a moment. I wanted to just share a couple other things, too. Touch becomes very important in the professional field of massage therapy because you have opportunities to work in different cultures if you decide that you want to. And it's very important to understand a particular culture and, and, and their social um, aspects of that so that you are aware of that when you are doing massage therapy in a professional way. And, um, and so even with, uh, the, even with young children versus uh, older adults, um, the, you know, professional touch uh, really uh, covers a broad, way, a broad area of things that you need to consider depending upon who you're working on, what country you're working in. What, prof- what, what, profession, what, what profession in massage that you're doing. And so uh, it's, uh, it's very fascinating, and there's a lot to learn in the area of just simply touch in and so of itself. So there's other types of avenues that a person can participate with massage. I mean, they can be an uh, individual practitioner. Uh, they can work, like, oh, what else? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's what's so exciting about the field. Uh-huh. You can start out with a private practice or you can start out in the spa industry, uh, which is a very popular uh, industry in uh, Northern California. Um, uh, there's many, many uh, beautiful destination spas here as well as day spas. And um, you can enter into the field later, start out in, let's say, spa therapies and then desire you want to go into a more clinical setting, okay. work, in a, work, for, work with a, along with a chiropractor in his office or a medical facility if they are looking for massage therapists uh, and work in that area. So there's many, many uh, avenues. You can, you can be a massage therapist on a cruise ship if you desire. That sounds exciting. <laughs> Very exciting. Or if you have an interest, I have one student who currently uh, wants to focus massage therapy, her practice, on working on doing massage on musicians and hopefully from time to time uh, go with uh, musicians across country while they're performing and work on them. There's people who, one gal just beginning our program uh, currently learned ballet and she has a very, very strong interest in doing massage for dancers. And once again, you have dance troops who travel internationally and you have dance troops locally that have their own, their own companies here where you can be hired to work on their um, they're, they're uh, dancers. It's a fascinating field with many, many avenues that you can, can go into. So you can start out in one and then switch to another and switch to another, depending upon uh, your interests as you mature into the profession. Now, when you uh, yeah. were to go from state to state, there are different regulations in different states, so you just have to know what each state requires for that profession. Some there's licensing, some there's certain number of hours, things of that sort. So they're able to do that from their professional organization to find that information. Yes, absolutely. Uh, when I was getting ready to relocate from Missouri, who was state licensed, and, and looking into California, uh, I, I had uh, California was not state licensed, so it wasn't really very much of an issue. And, and even though the state cannot have certain requirements uh, on a state level, counties can have specific requirements. And so you need to know where you're relocating to and do your research. The AMTA is a great organization, American Massage Therapy Association, that provides lots of information for you to let you know uh, where you're moving to and what the requirements of that state 
would uh, require you to uh, have to be a massage therapist in that state. And then, then there's the NCBTMB, the National um, Therapeutic Board uh, that uh, would Is also be Is that the helpful. examination that's the one that you have to actually take? It's a national organization where there's examinations yeah, required? That's, there's, well, there's two now, I think, but, but there's one that's very popular, uh, the National NCBTMB, National Board of Therapeutic massage and body work. I'm nationally certified. I've been nationally certified since 2001. And so uh, some states uh, require as a state exam to pass the national certification. And I think there's a, another organization starting up who, uh, who also on state to state level, I think there's maybe 10 or 13 states now who welcome, who also welcome that board, um, that or association. Um, that may have may have a, a hand in determining what state requirements would be or passing a particular exam. I don't know the particulars on that, but yes, you can be you can be nationally certified, you can be state li state licensed, or you can be certified by state. So there's many avenues where you can find out that information. Wonderful. I, I know before the show you actually mentioned that you had one of your students that. Uh, had previous training in animal massage and then wanted to also uh, work on people so then she uh, went to your school for uh, massage training so that sounds wonderful <laughs> both so it's people and animals and yeah so you can you can uh, acquire a certification in uh, massaging horses as uh, is, is one avenue uh, I'm not too familiar with the other ones but absolutely we had a student who was a massage therapist for equine massage and uh, and then decided to uh, work on humans. <laughs> so it just depends how the path leads you. You start in one area and you end up coming into a whole other area. So by being exposed to other things, then you find out what might be of more interest to you and then you're able to go from there. Absolutely. I think that uh, we as human beings uh, have an expansive uh, capacity to learn and I think that uh, it brings you, you can take it as far as you want to take it. I think we're all brilliant on many levels. Now I had to bring something else up. You had previously told me that um, while you were a massage therapist you also ran a natural foods kitchen. How did you come to doing working in the kitchen as well as doing massage? Well, um, to make a long story short, <laughs> When I was living at the, the Wellness Center in Missouri, um, which was uh, a wonderful 15 years, I had an opportunity to learn a lot of things. And uh, during that time, it was uh, running a Whole Foods kitchen. Um, you'd find me out on the tractor <laughs> mowing the, the uh, acres and, or caring uh, for the horses. Is nutrition important with massage therapy? I mean, what oh, a person drinks or eats. I mean, Absolutely. It sounds like that was a perfect fit for you being involved yeah. with nutrition yeah. and you also did body work and it seemed that they somehow went together. It does go together. I think that the more that you focus on your own health and the more you are in health, the more healthy your energy is when you give it to someone else. And uh, it was a great opportunity to learn how to eat right uh, to learn the, to uh, appreciate what exercise can do for the body and to learn how to food combine properly and to learn the difference between refined foods and whole foods that are much more nutritious and sprouting and juicing and the wonders of all of that. It's, it's a fascinating area to get into and one of the other programs that we have at Sky Hill Institute, not just holistic massage therapy, but we have what we call the Holistic Health Practitioner Program, which the students then, starting out massage, can continue on and learn all about holistic health. Now there's one area, I know that uh, you were telling me that you suggest to people after they have a massage that they drink water, a lot of water. Why? I mean, I know drinking water is good, but why specifically after a massage you have them all have something to drink? It's very important. Overall, the water, healthy water, is very important. Healthy by I mean water that doesn't have any pollutants in it. Um, but it, it meaning is not tap water. Uh, if spring water, spring or bottled water, water, or bottled water. If you're in a county that has pure tap.
tap water, then I get, and that, that would be okay. If you have a well that's tested and it's clean, that would be okay. So it just depends on where you live and what the requirements of the drinking water is. And, and you can always have your own water tested to make sure everything's in line. And so what's important, so important about water after you have body work done is that, you know, when you're working on the tissue, you will be able to assist the body in helping to release some of the toxins that are in, the, let's, say, let's say, the muscle tissue, for example. And so that comes into the, the bloodstream, and so it's wonderful for you to drink lots of water to flush out, uh, to help that clear out what's been released uh, into the system, um, and helping that to pass through uh, the organ systems and cleanse, cleanse that. So yes, uh, water is m most important after you have body work done. Are there other things that you would possibly suggest uh, a person do after a massage? Would they, is it possible they could feel sore, stiff uh, after getting a massage? Uh, sometimes I think when you're working with deep tissue and, and, and modalities that are on a deeper level, there may be some therapeutic, what I call therapeutic soreness. And I think that whether it's therapeutic soreness or, uh, or some, one might say therapeutic inflammation that might be created to help the body heal uh, in, in a particular situation, what the beauty of that is is to, to have someone suggest that they soak, soak in a, a, a warm tub full of warm water and use either, either Epsom salts, which uh, you can usually pick up at a local pharmacy, and or uh, some wonderful aromatherapy, sea salts, mineral salts, to help uh, remove more of the toxins in the body, in the muscles. Sounds and, wonderful. <laughs> yes, and help relieve tension. And so especially if you have some aromatherapy in it. But Epsom salts have been around for many, many ages, especially with athletes uh, who compete. Uh, they usually are very familiar with soaking in Epsom salts. And that's another type of massage, too. You were mentioning sports massage earlier. Uh, wonderful. Uh, there's different people along the way have, who have created different modalities, which we call our body work approaches, new things that surface over the years. And the beauty of that is that I foresee many new things coming into existence in the way of body work. They just haven't happened yet, but I know they're on the way. And uh, sports massage is a wonderful uh, avenue. Focus in on if you'd like to do that, and you can work with sports figures or sport teams, uh, lower body sports, upper body sports, overall body sports, you know, where you're using uh, all the body, but lower body sports, for example, uh, runners or cyclists, where the emphasis is a lot on the lower body. Uh, the school actually has the students go out and do sports massage when there are sporting events in San Francisco or in the Napa or other areas locally where there is competition of that nature, which is great for the students and great for the athletes, particularly after a long run. I've, I once saw a massage therapist during a marathon. Uh, there were tents set up for them, and I thought uh, definitely a benefit of running 26 miles is to be able to get a massage. <laughs> and they do wait in line, and they're very patient and good about that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Well, Denise, I want to thank you so much for... Uh, giving us this information with regards to massage therapy, holistic massage therapy, and thank you for your experience and coming here and uh, giving more information about it. And um, I'm thrilled that you're here in Petaluma. And thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, uh, viewers. And this is uh, all for now for Ask the Expert. I'm Patty Nuovo, signing off and remembering that health is natural. Thank you.